This is to apply the historic uh, to the Tobin, proposed Tobin Hill North Historic District. Um, this was previously continued from the February 21st hearing. There were a total of not 209 notices mailed, 86 notices to property owners in the subject area, 122 notices to property owners within 200 feet, and to the Tobin Hill Community Association. We received 14 responses in favor. 44 responses in opposition, and Tobin Hill Community Association is in favor. We also received a support letter from Beacon Hill Na Area Neighborhood Association, as well as support. And the uh, applicant, which is the Office of Historic Preservation, is here to request a continuance. Okay. 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 Good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, members of the Commission. I'm Kathy Rodriguez. I am the Deputy Historic Preservation Officer. I'll keep brief comments. So we are requesting a continuance at this time. Um, there's been an indication from the um, uh, property owners within the boundaries that there uh, is still some questions and that they'd like additional information. Um, this is the second in three public hearings that are part of the designation uh, process. Um, currently, I just wanted to remind everyone that the properties within the proposed boundaries are currently under interim protections, and uh, any modifications or demolition would be reviewed as if they were already designated. You are asking for how long of a continuance? Uh, continuance to the June 20th meeting to give us an opportunity to schedule a follow-up meeting with community members and, and uh, property owners. Okay, thank you. I am seeing some unhappy faces. Um, and we are going to continue with this hearing. Uh, the, applicant has yeah. for, uh, the applicant has asked for a continuance, I think for the good reason of wanting to have more dialogue, but you are all here, you are signed up to speak, and uh, the commission still has the option of uh, whatever motion we want to make. We can vote for a continuance today, we can vote for approval, we can vote for denial. We can, we can have all those motions that we would send to council. So uh, we are going to go ahead uh, you are free. You're signed up. You, can, you don't have to speak today if you don't want because there's a possibility of a continuance, but you are more than welcome to just go ahead and speak as planned. Uh, we will hear everything you have to say. We will have questions for staff. Um, we will treat this as a full hearing even though the city has asked for a continuance. So uh, first citizen sign up, please. First one I have is Rick Shell. Hey there, my name is Rick Shell. I live at 430 East Mistletoe. Uh, I am a resident homeowner, uh, and I have to express to you guys my displeasure. Uh, we have had you know, seven different meetings about the historic process. Um, I'm a little frustrated right now, I must say. Um, that being said, I do want to say that today you're going to hear support from longtime residents who have lived here their entire lives and have family in the neighborhood. You're going to hear support from a man who grew up on Mistletoe, and he loved it so much he bought two more homes in the proposed district. He lives in Monte Vista now, which is also historic, and he wants to help preserve the homes here. You'll hear support from folks who own homes and are raising their families in the pen. You'll hear support from people in the surrounding neighborhoods because they see the need for us to stand together against unchecked development. <laughs> You'll hear support from the Tobin Hill Community Association who recognizes the need to stand for the residents of our neighborhood. You'll hear support from people who were informed by OHP, came to public meetings, and decided for our neighborhood based on facts. You already received a lot of letters in support of this change that came directly from people within the district. And the question that I would pose to this commission is how many of the letters of opposition were verified in the same manner that the Office of Historic Preservation verified the 51% necessary to move this process forward? It's a question that you need to ask yourselves. I can very easily go and get my friends 
send in a letter that I'm opposed to something when I don't live within the district and I may have other ideas about what's going on. One of the things that I would also like to ask is that as you hear everybody, you have to realize that we're trusting you, commissioners, to make the right decision for us. HDRC has already approved the merits of our historic designation unanimously. That's already happened. Okay? We are hoping that you do what's right. You don't listen to the negative arguments, the misinformation that has been perpetuated around, and the false petitions that have been going around, and that you listen to the people that live in the neighborhood to move this forward, and that you approve our historic designation. Thank you. Next speaker is Nikki McDaniel. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> well, 
Thank you. Thank you. I was going to give a big old speech, but I just want to tell you that I am 1,100% supporting you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Federica Kushner, and then on deck we have Mark Spielman. I'm Frederica Kushner. I live at Thorville Bodies, Models for Women Helping Him. Uh, and I am intending to give a, uh, an official statement of the Tulsa Hill Community Association, but first, I would like to make a few short comments. Um, first of all, historic designation uh, has the unqualified support of the Tulsa Hill Community Association. Second, this case was approved by the HDRC. It is now in zone, not in HDRC. Uh, third, there are always going to be people who are not informed, um, who think that Dallas is the capital of Texas. Um, and you can't change that. Um, and if this is rescheduled to June, it will be the third time that the community has been asked to come out and support this. It seems to me a bit much. Um, I'll read this as quickly as I can. I believe you had it already in your practice. Members of our association have attended meetings of the residents of East Mistletoe and surrounding streets concerning historic designation. We can vouch that there has been real community involvement in the process. The northern part of the Tuckman Hill neighborhood is a microcosm of the historic development of much of the city of San Antonio. It was platted when there was a rock quarry in the vicinity and when the upper labora sequia was still evident enough to be used for a boundary. And by and large, the houses you see there today are the original ones, built for the workers at the quarry and the pearl brewery, as well as the managers and small businessmen of the city. It has remained residential because people want to live and raise their families on streets with that look and that feel, with trees and sidewalks and neighbors nearby. It's part of the residential core of the neighborhood, contributing to its historic character and enhancing the quality of all our lives. The new comprehensive plan for the city emphasizes growth of population density in areas close to downtown. That can be a good thing. It keeps the city alive. But this part of the city is already alive. Higher density must not be accomplished at the cost of the very thing that makes San Antonio unique, its small town feel and its old but vibrant neighborhoods close into the center of the city. Our historic neighborhoods are part of the signature of our city. Historic designation will give Mistletoe a layer of protection from piecemeal demolition and unwise development, while allowing it to continue to live and breathe as a contributing factor to the character of our of this unique city. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Spielman and on deck is Cynthia Spielman. Yeah, I'm, I'm ceding my time to Ben Fairbank. All right, next is Cynthia Spielman and on deck would be Jose Trevino. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Spielman. I'm the president of the Beacon Hill Area Neighborhood Association. On behalf of the Beacon Hill Area Neighborhood Association, I'm writing in support of the establishment of the designation of the historic district for Tobin Hill North. Our downtown neighborhoods are experiencing unprecedented stress as we move into the future. These neighborhoods, established in the early 20th century, are unique, and once gone, they can never be replaced. San Antonio cannot be great without its great historic urban neighborhoods and that help define who we are. There's nothing wrong with development for density, but it must be compatible with its neighborhood and the only way to guarantee this kind of development is through the historic district designation. Beacon Hill was told as we faced threat of incompatible development that our only sure recourse for protection was to seek an HD designation. So we don't understand why then Tobin Hill North is under threat of continuance and possible denial, especially when they've gone through the numerous public meetings, gathered the required majority of votes, and their application for an HD designation has been unanimously approved by HDRC. 
The denial of this request will have a chilling effect on all neighborhoods seeking an historic designation. Tobin Hill North has been encouraged to seek neighborhood conservation district designation in the place of an HD designation. There are some obvious problems with this approach. The developers understandably have stated they are unwilling to wait for the year that it takes to develop NCD standards. The NCD does not necessarily protect a neighborhood from incompatible development as evidenced by the recent developments in Beacon Hill. And this is not what the majority of the residents want. What is at risk is not just the preservation of historic buildings and architecture, but of a community. Preserve this neighborhood and help them welcome compatible and neighborhood-friendly development. Please support the establishment of their request for historic designation for Tobin Hill North. Thank you. Thank you. Jose Trevino, on deck will be Gloria Herrera. Okay, Mr. Trevino is, is not going to speak. Gloria Herrera, on deck will be Yvonne Gonzalez. Hello, um, I'm uh, Dr. Gloria Herrera. Um, uh, I live on 502 East Mistletoe with my husband, uh, Bruce Norton, and um, I support the designation for the historic district for Tobin Hill North. Um, I um, want to uh, say that um, uh, that um, um, some of the people that uh, oppose the um, designation of historic uh, also um, own um, uh, <coughs> rental uh, or they own homes in the um, area and they uh, rent out their their homes uh, but they do not uh, live in the in the district. Um, I think it's been a, a benefit to the neighborhood uh, for it to be um, a pending historic district in October uh, 2016. Uh, Terra Market proposed what I thought was an inappropriate development at 421 and 425 East Mistletoe Avenue. And, um, um, it was brought up at the last meeting that the majority of homes have spacious front yards and backyards, and um, my house on East Mistletoe has um, great myrtle trees, a pomegranate tree. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Good afternoon. My name is Yvonne Gonzalez. I was going to read something, but I don't know how good about what she said. Some people own the property and they'll live in the property. But I have been terribly concerned with this property since I was born and came home from the hospital many, many years ago to that particular house. There's so many unique qualities about that house that it's impossible to tell you all. I brought two maps that I have, along the way I have collected different things, and I brought a map of our area. One is from 1909, the other one is from 1912. And the reason I brought them was because, in a spiritual way, that's what this neighborhood is. It is a journey of the spirit for me because I feel very attached. But it's also something that has to do with our history. Uh, San Antonio is unique. And if you allow these things to happen, people to come in, build, knock down stuff, 
we're going to lose that uniqueness and all of that income that we supposedly were going to get is going to disappear. But worst of all, our soul is going to die. That's part of us. And so I ask you please, please consider what um, what you are I don't know if you were able to see it or not. But it had to do, what I wanted to tell you about was that uh, the Tobin Hill was originally called the Rock Quarry neighborhood. And the Rock Quarry neighborhood first appeared in the late 19th century. The legend has it that the mortar used in the Alamo Mission came from this area. Many of the city's oldest limestone buildings were made from rock taken from the park. My family, in fact, was said to have donated stone from San Fernando Cathedral from there. The families that worked in the quarry settled in the area on streets such as East Mistletoe and Ewalk, which used to be called East Walk. Many of the oldest families still have descendants living in the old Rock Quarry neighborhood. Unlike most inner city neighborhoods, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the original families still live in the area. The legend of the old rock quarry and the strong culture that still bonds the families bonds us all together. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Vivian Wool, followed by bring them back to you. Albert Arias. I'm sorry, followed by Andrea Bernardo. Hello, I'm Vivian Rule. I, uh, my husband and I live at 307 East Mistletoe. We bought that house three years ago, moved in from Bernie, and we love it. It's just a charming street. Uh, every house different, uh, mostly small, single family homes. Uh, we would really like to protect the character of that neighborhood. Um, I didn't grow up there like Yvonne did, but I grew up in a neighborhood very like that, and it feels like that. And uh, there are people with children who are enjoying that cozy feel that a neighborhood like that has. So I ask you to protect it. Thank you. Andrea Granon, followed by Albert Arias. Andrea? to live on Mistletoe Street in 1967. Very happy in that neighborhood. Her grandchild and great-grandchildren were born there. And she hopes that the neighborhood will stay as it is. She really appreciates that. Albert Arias, followed by Paula Starnes. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Albert Arias. My family moved into Tobago in 1960. I was seven years old. And I lived there, oh man, probably about 40 years before I moved to Monta Vista. But I still own three rental properties in the proposed historic district. And 
One thing I can say about the house is that it should be preserved. I'm in favor of historical designation. But one thing people don't realize, you can drive by there and see these homes, but you have to go inside to see what these houses look like. The woodwork, uh, the pine floors, some have oak floors, but there's also a species of uh, pine wood called longleaf pine. And uh, that pine is hard to find. It's a shame if anybody would start destroying these beautiful homes in this neighborhood for any reason. And we're under great pressure, like the previous uh, discussion at Dignity Hill about putting uh, apartments behind somebody's house. Uh, you know, maybe that will help preserve a neighborhood, but they have to conform. And, uh, and since uh, I also lived, like I said, for about 40 years in, in Tobin Hill, and I lived in two of the houses in the proposed district. And I can see why these other, why these other neighbors are so passionate about getting historic, because they want to preserve their homes, because they live in them, and they want to like be able to pass them on to children, grandchildren, what have you. But we want to have a an intact neighborhood because it's under great stress. So I hope you all vote and agree with our historic designation. Thank you. Paula Starnes, followed by Sandra Levy. Hello, my name is Paula Starnes. I live at 219 East Magnolia for 27 years, and before that, I lived it on East Mistletoe and rented for seven years. So I've been part of the neighborhood for 35 years. I'm here to speak in support of the historic district because we've got to maintain our neighborhoods throughout the inner city before somebody destroys them. In addition to my support, I have a letter here from another resident that I would like to read. Zoning Commissioners. This is from Kathy Kitch, who is president of the Zary marketing. He says, please note that I am in full support for the designation of the historic district for Tolan Hill North. I own the office building at 2520 McCullough, which houses a digital advertising agency. One of our clients, Ditton Communities, has been defining San Antonio residential communities for over 70 years. I've learned a lot from them. It's simple. If you have a quality neighborhood, which has thoroughly, which was thoroughly planned and constructed, the value of your property will be retained. The added bonus, pride of ownership, creates a safer, more stable environment. Being in historic district keeps that concept intact. Everyone that works in our building provides our clients with beautiful, well thought out design on a daily basis. Of course, we want that to extend beyond our working environment into our community. Again, this is from Kathy Kitch. Thank you. Sandra Levy, followed by Lynn Swanson. Hello, I'm Sandra Levy, and I live at 104 Ewald, and that is the little one street that goes up and looks like it's dead-ended, but it's not. There's a, there's a loop around. Uh, we just got that street paved after a five-year begging with the city. It finally happened a couple of years ago. And the houses on that street are a maximum, mine may be the biggest, it's 600 square feet. Uh, I bought my house as a teardown in 2007. And it was, the roof was like this instead of this. And the foundation was completely gone. So these are not historic houses. These are little old houses that uh, originally were built as shotguns in 1904 for the, for the people who were building the quarry, uh, building downtown, going to the quarry and getting stones. Uh, my house has been added on to four times, and it's 600 square feet. The historical designation is gone. It's ruined. There is no historical to hold up. My house was made as modern as possible when I redid it. 
so that it would hold up as a, as a new form. I haven't seen anybody try to take down anything in the neighborhood. I've seen about six houses since I moved there that have been remodeled and they look great. They look better than they did. But nobody is coming in to tear down the houses to put up a parking lot because the, park, the lots are not big enough. I am confused that I thought we were talking about rezoning to make multifamily and I don't want it to be rezoned for multifamily because there's no parking. But to make it historic is going to give the historic society some big problems because nobody there can afford to do what historical societies require of you when you want to paint your house or you want to add on or you want to improve. You have to do what they say, mm -hmm. not what you might want to do. And I'm on a fixed income, as most of the people in my neighborhood are, and I'm old, as most of them are. And we don't want anybody telling us what to do with our houses. We're not going to tear it up and you know try to make it into something uh, that Monte Vista has or, or uh, what those other fancy neighborhoods are. We're not the fancy one. We're the body of the area. And we need to stay that way. Thank you. Lynn Swanson, followed by Daniel Trevino. Hi, I'm Lynn Swanson. Uh, I'm speaking um, in opposition to the opposed designation as historic for this neighborhood. Um, I'm sure many of you are very uh, familiar with the process of this. Uh, in the fall of 2016, um, the OHP, Office of Historic Preservation, sent out postcards to all uh, property owners in the proposed area and asked for a vote of either for or against uh, for approval or against historic designation for the neighborhood. Uh, during the process, some of the properties owned by people who were known to be opposed to this designation were removed from the proposed district. And the um, district was reduced from about 99 properties to 88 properties. Then in December, a meeting was held in which OHP announced that they had a majority of the neighborhood voting uh, in favor of this designation and they took over jurisdiction of the neighborhood. Apparently some at the meeting questioned the majority vote at the time, but the whole process went forward and historic went forward with their plan to take over the neighborhood. Since the December meeting, OHP has not publicly answered any questions about the results of the vote. Um, or reinstated a sketch that had been on their website that showed all lots in the proposed area with the votes that they had received. Uh, despite many questions about the website sketch and the actual votes, no information has been forthcoming. Uh, this lack of transparency and the deafening silence um, led some in the neighborhood to try to fill the information vacuum by doing a survey of their own. Their survey indicated that a majority of the homeowners are actually now opposed to this designation. I ask that you vote against this designation based on the fact that neighborhood support has not been demonstrated by OHP and that in fact the majority may feel very differently. Thank you very much. Next person, Daniel Trevino, followed by Cynthia Pujol. Thank you, my son. To who? David. David McCullough. Okay. Next person is Cynthia Pujol, followed by David Moncala. It's Christina Pujol. Oh. And um, I have to give my time to David Moncala. Okay, David, you're next, and you get a total of nine minutes.
Good afternoon. My name is David Hampala. I'm a property owner within the proposed district. And I first would like to make a request that the Office of Coastal Historical Preservation withdraw its request for a continuance. Uh, we ask that this be decided today one way or the other. You're about to make a decision on an issue that has deeply divided a once harmonious neighborhood. The proposed historic district is full of long-term residents whose families have shaped and created what it is today. It has undergone many transitions and for the past several years has been a hotbed of renovations and redevelopment. The majority of the properties within the proposed district have already undergone, undergone improvements which would not in the future be approved by the Historic Commission. It is these very improvements and development that have made the neighborhood we all love what it is today. It was accomplished without the interference of mandates on appearance designed by a government entity. For those who may not be aware of the background, the application for a start was originally filed in an effort to stop the owner of the property at 425 East Mississippi from developing their property as they desired. They had applied to become an IDZ and to put four individual properties on each of their two lots. A petition was circulated in the neighborhood in opposition to the rezoning, but its effectiveness remained unclear. The applicant was advised by OHP that simply submitting an application for a historic designation, they would stop the demolition of the property until the application had run its course, which would take up to one year. The application was filed, the process started, and OHP took over the jurisdiction of what happened in the neighborhood. Unbeknownst to the applicant, the property owner had already received permission for demolition, and the buildings were removed. This commission, later, against the recommendation of its staff, denied the application for an IDZ. There are many, many concerns with the ways and method the historic process has moved forward. There has been great misinformation on all sides of the issue, and to this date, few people have a complete understanding of the impact it would have. This hearing has already been delayed twice in an effort to allow more time to present all of the options. We attempted to look at creating an NCD as a compromise of sorts to protect the look of our neighborhood. Our councilmen organized a neighborhood meeting and attempted to do just that. But unfortunately, that meeting quickly spiraled out of control and as it developed into keeping people speaking out of turn, yelling over each other, and was infiltrated by people from outside of the neighborhood with a gripe and personal agenda about something totally unrelated. As we all know, in order for a historic application to move forward, a 51% majority of the property owners in the proposed district must be in favor of the designation. The original application included 99 properties which, have been, which would have required 50, 50, 50 of them to go along. By converting the opposition to the IDC into support for historic, the process moved ahead extremely fast. It is still unclear how the votes were counted or tabulated, but we received word that a majority was reached and the process would move forward with only 45 property owners in favor. We then learned that the map was gerrymandered, a number of people in opposition were taken out, and the property's number of properties was re reduced from 99 to 88. Mm -hmm. The support for historic was rapidly decreasing as people were changing their minds once they were informed. The staff and leadership at OHP knew at the time of the HDRC meeting that there was no longer 51% support. Rather than ask for the hearing to be delayed, they pushed it forward and the HDRC board subsequently voted to recommend the initiative be created without the consent of the residents. Many of us believe that the process was conducted in a matter contrary to what is stated in UDC, but that is something that will be sorted out by people in the know in the coming weeks and months. A number of us have been canvassing the neighborhood, speaking to our neighbors, disseminating information, and gathering signatures in opposition to this historic designation. If we revert back to the original application, which included 99 properties, I believe we can document that over 70% of those have not given their blessing to a historic designation. And as you can see on this map that's on there, all of the red ones are people who are opposed and have signed petitions they have copies of that are opposed to it putting the opposition at 60.2% of the current 88 properties that are there. Um, there's also reference on the, uh, the list that you have of 12 additional properties who are gerrymandered out of the, um, the proposed district who are also in opposition to it. So the opposition to this is, is great. 
and so ardent is this opposition, particularly on the east half of the proposed district, that the property owners there have banded together in a process of creating a new neighborhood association that would include 66 contiguous properties in the 400 to 700 block of Mistletoe, including Ewald Kingsport and Valentino. The bylaws have been written, the officers selected, the application is filled out and ready for submission. As it would overlap a current voluntary association, we are prepared to seek permission from the Secretary of State's office to create a mandatory association. 90% of those people in that proposed new association simply just want to be left alone and are against the historic designation. And we're going to ask at the least that this area be removed from the map of the proposed historic boundaries. A close examination of the neighborhood would show homes typical to any other home you would find within Inner Loop 410. Which could be considered, while it could be considered an old neighborhood, there is really only one building that could be considered to have historic, historically contributed to the neighborhood. Yes, there are many stories of personal family history here, and of families that have lived there various times during the growth and development of the city. The stories are not unique overall and shouldn't be used to dictate further growth and development. When one considers the history of the city, the prominence of the leaders and the people who developed it, what future historians will write about, I'm not aware of anyone that would be included in those annuals to be from this neighborhood, nor am I aware of any structure in the proposed district, with the exception of one, that bore any significance in creating the neighborhood that it is today. It had been a neighborhood in disrepair that had been slowly revitalized mostly from west to east, and only a handful of properties remain that had not been updated. The renovations that have been made have not affected the look or feel of the neighborhood, they have made it what it is. Almost 60% of the houses have replacement windows that would no longer be approved by HDRC. Over 30% have entry doors that would most likely not attain approval. A majority of the properties on the east end have chain link fences, which would not meet historic criteria. It would be extremely unfair to impose these new expensive standards on the few who have not made upgrades to their properties. The owner of the property at 425 East Mistletoe, the catalyst for the whole process, is already obtaining approval for his project from the HDRC. The construction on the property will be in the style and manner of fitting the neighborhood. This historic neighborhood, this historic designation is simply not needed to retain the look and feel. There are a few other lots on the street also designated for Mocha family. I'm sure you will hear from them that they have no intent to, or desire to develop them in a manner unbefitting to the area. All the property owners in the area, whether they have lived there for generations or are relative newcomers, have all had equal opportunity to research what the development potential is for the neighborhood, or has been, within the recurrent, current restrictions, codes, and guidelines. The applicant who had only lived in the area for a couple of years has self-professed to have fallen in love with the neighborhood as it was. It is now asking you to impose new restrictions against her neighbors who created what she loved. I ask that you do not further this rift in the neighborhood, and we could allow the deep division to begin to heal. We do not want to live in such a deeply divided community. We despise the derision, name-calling, labels, and political activism that surrounded this issue. The proponents for the designation are a small, albeit very vocal, minority. Do not let their voices draw the quiet majority who simply want to be left alone. Please vote to deny this historic designation and send their recommendation to the City Council for final disposition of this application. And once again, I draw your attention to the map and the great amount of uh, opposition to this is by far the majority of the entire proposed district. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Daniel, sorry, it's staff doing the Spurs rally. Oh. <laughs> you get the spirit, it's a game. All right. <laughs> Next, we have Ben Fairbank. <laughs> Ben Fairbanks, you have six minutes. My name is Ben Fairbanks, and I live at 208 East Magnolia Avenue in Turban Hill. Although I am a member of the Turban Hill Community Association, I serve on its zoning task force. A statement of the Turban Hill Community Association has been given today by Ms. Ricky Cushman. I am speaking as an individual today in support of the proposed change to create the Tobin Hill North Historic District, case Z-2017-061. 
Most of the arguments, both pro and con, and there have been many of them both, that I have heard in recent months concerning the proposed historic district have addressed the perceived effects the change would have on residents of the district and or on those who would either build in the district or have other non-residential interests in the district. These are all valid and important concerns, but I would like to suggest that it is both valid and important to take a wider perspective as well. Let me explain. About 45 years ago, when as a new PhD experimental psychologist by training, I was teaching introductory psychology at New Mexico State University, I sought to prepare a lecture that would show students how the methods of psychological measurement might be relevant to everyday life. In order to do so, I prepared a lecture based on a book by Kevin Minch entitled The Image of the City. And as an aside, I recommend that book strongly to all the performing tasks such as yours as members of the Zoning Commission. I face now the task of compressing a 50-minute lecture in six minutes. Lynch and his associates at Massachusetts Institute of Technology used well-established methods of experimental psychology to investigate how people, both residents and visitors, build up internal or mental images of a city. They determine the kinds of elements that city dwellers abstract from their cities while living in them. They found a fairly small number of kinds of elements. These kinds of elements include edges of cities, and I believe that San Antonio's edges are diffuse and vague as the city peters off into the surrounding territory. Roots within the city, and San Antonio has well-defined roots, especially the limited access highways and main thoroughfares such as San Pedro, Sarsamara Street, East and West Commerce Street, and others. Landmarks, San Antonio is well endowed with landmarks, including the Alamo, the Taj Mahal, and Randolph Air Force Base, the Riverwalk, the Mission, the Tower of the Americas, Market Square, the Boots, and many others. And finally, for this condensed presentation, neighborhoods, such as San Antonio's downtown, King William, Alamo Heights, the Pearl, Monte Vista, and quite a number of others. Very briefly, Lynch used techniques such as asking residents to reveal, uh, asking residents questions to reveal the residents' internal representation of the city. How do I get to the San Antonio, from the San Antonio Development Services Department to the airport? How will I know when I am getting close? How will I know that I am there? What will I pass on the way? Why is all of that relevant to this case? Because Lynch and his colleagues, in studying three cities in detail and many others less intensively, found that it is the number, the distinctiveness, and the richness of such elements in the images of those who know the cities that give cities their perceived character, their memorableness, and the richness of such elements in the images of those who know the cities, excuse me, uh, their character, their memorableness, and much of their appeal. I believe that by creating the Tolman Hill North Historic District, we will add to the city a memorable, distinctive neighborhood that will make San Antonio an even more attractive and interesting place to live than it is now. The city with an additional appealing and important asset. In conclusion, we do not get such chances very often. And when they go by, it may be that they will be gone forever, because once too many changes have been made in a potential historic district, it will no longer be appropriate to consider it for a historical district recognition. I therefore urge you to seize this opportunity to change the city for the better, to make it a bit more memorable, interesting, and appealing by increasing the diversity and distinctiveness of the neighborhoods in the vicinity of that. By Sharif Gow. Thank you. Oakley, and I own the property at 712 East Mistletoe Avenue. Uh, I'm in complete opposition to the creation of the Mistletoe Historic District. Now, to clarify, I am in favor of preserving any and all historical value, but I know that my street is not holding, except for the Little Alamo, a property located at 629.5 East Mistletoe. The entire push for a one street historic district was done so in an effort to stop the owner of 425 from demolishing two of the ugliest duplexes ever built and improving the property. I think it's a gross misuse of the historical designation as a tool to stop rezoning efforts. After the application had been submitted, 
and people actually began to get the facts about what it would really mean to go to historic, opposition skyrocketed. Many of the initial supporters that helped reach the 51% had signed because they were either not informed about all the facts or had been annoyed and pressured many, many times by the applicant. After, been, after, after having been informed, the opposition is now at more than 70%, and there is division in what once was a quiet, unified neighborhood. I please ask the zoning committee do not recommend the creation of the Mistletoe Historic District to City Council. The people of this neighborhood just want to be left alone. Thank you. Cherise Bell, is she still here? Next is Marilyn Corchesi. Um, so no Marilyn Corchesi. She had to go to work. Can you state the people that are that have left whether or not they specify it as support or opposition? Cherise Bell in support, Marilyn Corchesi in support. Next is Cindy Miller. Good afternoon, I'm Cindy Miller. I live in Tilden Hill. Um, I'm here to support the uh, historical designation, and the reason that I'm supporting the historical designation is that what we're seeing throughout our neighborhoods is kind of a, a mining project. You know, our, our property values are going up. Downtown, when I bought my house, people thought I was crazy. People looked at me and said, oh my gosh, you bought a house where? And they looked like they'd throw up. And now I say where I live, and people go, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And so there's been a sea change in the downtown neighborhoods with the Riverwalk extension, with the Pearl District, with much of the, the desirability of our downtown neighborhoods increasing. I've heard a lot of conversation about neighborhood conservation districts. I hear a lot of people say, we just want to have an NCD that has teeth. I've been in planning meetings with our city planner. I've been in our neighborhood meetings. And what I've found out is that NCD has no teeth. NCD does not protect us. Zoning and historical district is what protects the character of our neighborhoods. And without having historical designation, anyone from anywhere, and I might point out that some of the people who are speaking for us are not residents of San Antonio and are certainly not residents of our um, downtown neighborhoods. And I think that if you're coming from Houston or from the suburbs, you may not have a um, accurate picture of the character of the neighborhood. And so um, I think that one of the ways that we can protect our neighborhood, Tobin Hill did not go historical as an entire neighborhood like King William and like Monte Vista. Our neighborhood is very diverse. We are home to industrial sites like Flasher. We're home to the huge um, Methodist hospital complex. We have such a diverse neighborhood that when you look at our NCD, I mean, at our uh, neighborhood plans, our residential neighborhood in Tobin Hill is a very narrow swath of Tobin Hill. And to protect our neighborhood, it seems to me that going historical is really the only real protection that we have from urban development, which is going to be lot line to lot line, modernized, high density. And so I hope that you will support the historical designation because I believe you'll see more of us coming forward in the future. Thank you. Gabriel Arias, followed by Lydia Kelly. Oh, I'm sorry, not Lydia Kelly, followed by Susan Furman. Um, so next person I have is Susan Furman, followed by Kyle Ruthie. I'm sorry, I think that he just gave his time to someone who already spoke, so we need to untangle that. Oh, 
I was told, uh, they were, I told at the beginning, I have a statement from the neighborhood that could not be here today. And the ladies at the front said that that was how we had to handle it in order to have this statement read today. Okay, so if, um, so since you already spoke, if he can either read it as a statement into the record or he can have somebody else read it at the sign in once you read it. Take us out. That's our only request. Um, 
this is this is not an inclusive process that others may allude to. That's why the city has asked for another continuance. Um, uh, it, it strikes me that like, I, I'm not a member of the Beacon Hill Neighborhood Association because Beacon Hill doesn't represent me because that's not where I live. Uh, historic preservation is not the only way forward. We can look at NCDs or NCDs that have teeth. It's something that can be let it out. That's something the city would like to discuss with fairly. That's why the city continues. Richard Moore, followed by Michael Nicole. Richard Moore, president of the original 1979 Tobin Hill Neighborhood Association. I'm also a 50-year resident architect of Tobin Hill. I was present when the historical staff fraudulently created a Tobin Hill historic. You have heard even Beacon Hill coming over here trying to impress you. I, I feel that at this time I would recommend to this commission that either continue with the continuance because you have been shown a plan, a, a plan of most of the residents of Mistletoe against this historical designation. I'm an architect. I have confronted and faced the historical board. It's a very arrogant board that dictates their own personal taste as far as architects are concerned or non-architects on this commission. I strongly, strongly recommend that this thing be continued as staff has recommended because I would recommend that the city clerk send out a registered letter to every resident on Mistletoe, not East Park, not Magnolia, but residents that you are considering historical today. Because I don't trust the historical staff. So therefore, I think the city clerk ought to send a registered letter to every resident on Mistletoe to, to cast their vote, either yes or no. I strongly recommend that this area not be designated historical because they dictate their own personal touches to your own property. And it's my property and I can do what I want to with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Nicole, followed by Anissa Schell. Just a reminder, we have a lot of people left to speak and we don't have time for applause. Michael McCool. All right, Anissa Schell. Michael McCool. Oh, sorry, yes, that's right. Michael McCool was speaking. Um, I'm guessing against. He signed over that column and didn't check off. He opposes, he is representing 629 East Mistletoe, the owner of the property. Okay, thank you. We got it. All right, Anissa Schell, followed by Judy Bowden.
the opposition is right about something. Back in September of last year, one of our properties was sold to a developer, and they proposed building six single-family homes on their two lots. Um, at that time, it was presented as one lot. It was high-density zoning. Um, we came before you in October and opposed this project. It was a catalyst. It unified our neighborhood. We had several meetings, and um, actually at their suggestion, um, we met with the city regarding the neighborhood conservation district, as well as historic designation to find out what would be best for us so that we could protect ourselves. Uh, we voted at that meeting to file for historic designation, and I filed the original application on their behalf. Um, at that time, I worked with the Office of Historic Preservation, who I contacted, and they guided me through the process of how to collect signatures, how to talk to people. We had several meetings where information was passed out in both English and Spanish. They were inclusive of everyone within the district because the Office of Historic Preservation mailed the invitations. When some of the properties on Valentino expressed that they did not want to be included, we dropped them out of the district, changing the boundaries because we did not want to force it upon them. We've had seven meetings about historic designation. If people still have questions and they have not attended meetings, I cannot speak for them. We have presented factual information to everyone in English and Spanish, and we understand what this designation will mean for our neighborhood. We're excited to be empowered as residents to have a say in how our neighborhood continues to grow and develop. Devon Hill North is situated perfectly to become a historic district. We're bordered on two sides by Monta Vista, the other side by River Road, and to the south is the already established historic portion of Tobin Hill. There's no region we should not be considered historic. Preservation is not about resisting change, it's about properly managing change. A historic designation for our neighborhood will empower the residents here to have a say in the future of Tobin Homeworth. They're proud to receive the recognition that becoming historic will give our community. I would like to ask those in support to please stand up. Thank you for your time. Judy Bo, followed by Jeanette Blount. Good afternoon. I thought I was the last speaker, but it was someone signing in after me. <laughs> My husband and I own the house at 510 East Mistletoe. I am truly surprised that there are not more people here speaking in opposition to this because I know that almost 100% of the people east of my home are in opposition. And 510 is sort of in the middle of the block, or maybe a little bit to the west. Um, the only thing I want to say is that some of the people in favor of historic designation have commented that an NCD is weak. It is only weak if you make it weak. It can be very strong and block anything you want to block if you make it that way. Some neighborhoods have made theirs weak and they have suffered for it. We don't want to make it weak if we have an NCD, but that is for the discussion. What I'd like to say is that we always like to think that in America, majority rules, and we want to say that the vast majority of people on East Mistletoe are in opposition to historic designation, and I hope you can take this into consideration when you vote, and please vote today. It's been continued so many times. We've got to get this up one way or the other. Thank you very much. Jeanette Blount. No That's all that's going to speak. And Jeanette had signed it in opposition. Okay, thank you. Uh, the city is the applicant. Um, it was, of course, your choice not to do the full presentation, um, asking for the continuance. Um, I'm going to give you the rebuttal time, but just like with everybody else today, I'm holding that to a time three minutes. Um, thank you. I, I don't really know what else there is for us to say. Um, there was a lot of information uh, by the speakers. Um, 
both on, on both sides of the, the position. I, I would say there is some misinformation, but I think that that's been kind of common uh, throughout this process, but not unique to this process. Um, in all um, zoning cases, as well as um, historic designations, uh, sometimes there is misinformation floating around out there that we hope that uh, they will contact our office for uh, clarification. For example, window units, we're not going to ask anybody to take out their window units. Um, I will say that um, there's confusion about what's historic and you know high style and what is not high style. Uh, Monta Vista and King William get mentioned quite frequently. That's only two of the 27 districts that we have, and not all of the districts look like King William or Monta Vista. Um, and the HDRC and, and OHP do not uh, make decisions or recommendations based on personal preference. Uh, we make those recommendations as professionals trained in the field. Um, in accordance with the UDC and the uh, designated, I'm sorry, the uh, adopted design guidelines. Um, we welcome any opportunity to provide information, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or at a community meeting. And of course, uh, I'm here if the commissioners have any other questions. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to start with questions. Um, we'll start with Commissioner Diaz-Sanchez. Some questions for OHP and for staff. And I'm sorry. Um, I know a lot of the people in the room um, are aware of the various processes, um, but I would like for it to be on record regarding the 51%, the changes of the delineation of the border, how that relates to your policy, um, and how, if, if that policy is being revisited given the multiple issues um, over the course of the, I guess, this year. So from a historic standpoint, and what the, the UDC says currently, is that uh, the property owners are asked uh, to let us know if they are in favor or um, in opposition of initiating the process for designation. Uh, currently, the UDC requires that 51% of the properties indicate that they are in support of um, initiating that process. Um, there's, there's no current effort to change that. There has been discussion, uh, which there usually is when we're in the middle of the designation, um, but uh, there's no effort at this point to amend the UDC. So I, I just ask, what are the benefits of zoning something historic when a property owner is one, not aware, and two, not in support? Um, if a property owner is not aware, then there's probably either they're deceased or they are in a, um, a facility or are not getting the mail. Uh, we sent out multiple notices. If you visit our website, you'll see samples of those notices that we sent out, and we send them directly to property owners. Um, I know that sometimes things don't make it once, but we try to do multiple mailings to make sure that they do get through. And I'm sorry, what was your second question? I'm just interested, if you, if you don't reach them, what are, the what are the benefits of rezoning a property if the property owner has not been notified, that is not, if that is not verified? So, for instance, I understand it is OHP's policy to get 51% of the majority in order to start the process, but at what point do you reevaluate that percentage? So we keep track of the percentage along the way. The UDC only requires that we reach that threshold to initiate the process. It doesn't direct us to stop in between because sometimes that figure can fluctuate um, because people get information and could change their position along the way. So the UDC gives us that threshold to at least begin the process and hopefully continue the conversation at these hearings or in, in um, uh, meetings in between. Um, the benefit to moving forward, we're talking about the designation of the historic district that impact um, all of the property owners, not just them individually. Um, and so if there are a few that are in opposition, we'd like to know that they're, uh, what their position is, but we don't feel that that should stop the process so that that can be revealed along the way. Um, perhaps they're in opposition for a number of reasons, and if there's any questions that we can answer for them to help them make an, uh, an informed decision, then that's what our role is along the way in this process. Do you currently know, we, we have been, as a commission, presented with various percentages, people standing up, I know people have left, we have been sent emails individually in groups, there have been multiple meetings, but I have to be honest, as at OHP, as an applicant, it has been very unclear on how that percentage has been fluctuated, which makes it very challenging to make 
a determination on this case whether or not there is a majority of support. So what is the percentage currently and how have you been tracking that? So I don't know the exact number. I do believe it's under 40% at this time. And then we'll also get with DSD staff to see what notices they receive. I don't know how many of the 40-something notices are actually the property owners within the boundary or if they are the adjacent property owners. But um, the number does fluctuate because every single day we get the information on both sides. Um, the UDC, the fact that the percentage changes does not change the fact that it is an eligible district and that at one point we did meet the threshold to begin the process. And so um, it can fluctuate in either direction along the way. So is your request for a continuance to have a better understanding of that percentage? Because I, under I understand that it fluctuates, but it's important to keep track of that fluctuation in order for us to make a determination. We do on a daily basis. Um, and my point is, is that the percentage along the way does not affect the process because that has already been that has already been verified and in, in, in it has March. started the process, but we're currently in the process. Yes. So while we're in the process, it is important to acknowledge that changing percentage. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But it doesn't stop us. It doesn't give us the direction to stop the work that we're doing. And so the uh, reason for the continuance is to provide another public meeting. Um, to uh, reach out maybe to the individuals who replied um, in the, the CARS to Development Services to make sure that they know about the public meeting so that they can come and get their answers, um, answers to their questions or to just simply let us know again how, uh, how they feel. Thank you. Oh, I have questions for staff. Can you state again when the notices were mailed out when, and with the initial report at the beginning, when that was issued, the number of notices that went out, opposition and support. So in the beginning when the case was originally considered, it was originally considered on February 21st. So we typically send notices out at least 10 days prior to the date of the hearing. So our policy has always been about between uh, 12 and 13 days. So with that original uh, notice that went out, there were a total of 209 notices mailed. 86 notices were sent to property owners in the subject area, 122 notices to property owners within 200 feet. Uh, we received 14 responses in favor. 44 responses in opposition, and that includes the petition that we have received. And then, of course, we received uh, notices from the Neighborhood Association for Children Hill Community Association and Beacon Hill Area Neighborhood Association in support. Thank you. I'm going to see other commissioners to ask more questions. I have comments, but. Okay, um, let's start at the end and just move down. So, I have questions on some of the things that were said. So, um, I think I may already know those answers, but so things like if the shatterproof windows are those not allowed in historic uh, right. districts, um, their existing properties, they're not, they're, I, my understanding is that they're not required to change whatever is existing. Um, so, so yes, they can make changes to glass. If there's a requirement for shatterproof glass, of course they can change that glass. Um, there's in the guidelines. There's absolutely nothing in the adopted guidelines that say prohibited. There's nothing in the adopted guidelines that says you cannot. What is in the guidelines is this is what's recommended. This is the recommended treatment. Um, if you would like to request something that's not recommended, you can do that uh, through the HDRC, which we have an approval rating of 98% of all the applications that are heard by the commission. Is that true? Is that true? I think I heard you say that you start the process after you get 51% uh, or more in favor. Does that include the property owners and the uh, affected neighborhood? That's the actual property owners within the boundaries. So 
So you, you have actually received 51% uh, of the property owners in favor of yes. the process? Yes. Before we called, I don't have the date in front of me, before we called the original HTRC meeting, we verified by phone and email 51% um, in support of initiating the process. Has the boundary has been changed since you started the process? Yes, the boundary has been made smaller, and I'm, I'm sorry, someone else asked me that, and I'm sorry I didn't answer that question earlier. So the boundary was reduced, and that was in a conversation and coordination with the applicant. Um, it's not unusual for that boundary to change along the way um, for lots of reasons, um, whether it's a, a properties are being impacted and, and by other ordinances that provide protection, or if they uh, are just not in support of being part of the district. And um, it's not meant to be underhanded, it's really by nature of the process, which you want a higher percentage of people in support, so, so reducing the boundaries can achieve that. But if you were to keep the same old boundary, would you still have the majority percent in favor? Uh, no, if we kept the original boundary, we wouldn't, although there's nothing in the UDC that says that it has to remain. You can change the boundary. It's a uh, real quick uh, staff, if you just wait a minute. Uh, what are the numbers, staff, for the, if you had 209 that were uh, sent out for the you look again? The 209 notices mailed, 86 of those were sent to property owners in the subject area, 122 notices to property owners within 200 feet. So of those mailed out, 14 responses received in favor, 44 responses in opposition. So do we count the 120 that are just surrounding the property area? Because they're, they're not really affected. I mean, well, yes, they're, within, they're included in that number because they're within 200 feet of the uh, proposed zoning. And so we send notice out to property owners within 200 feet of the subject area as well as the subject areas that need to be zoned. Okay. I was just confused with 51% of yourself. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Diaz Sanchez, are you ready to make a motion or do you want to have? Quick comments from us? Or um, I, I have several comments. It's, I have several comments. Um, I'm, I'm deeply disappointed in the way this process um, has, what has happened in, it's been several months. Um, the fact that in the presentation, the applicant wishes Office of Historic Preservation has not presented us with an update of the percentages of support and opposition. Um, it makes it very difficult as a commission to see people stand up. Some people have to leave because they have work to go to. To not have a real, um, an idea of how this community feels on a consistent basis. We receive maps today that aren't dated. Again, I know people are changing their mind the more that they know. Um, it's, it's just become a real challenge. Obviously, there was a process where we were examining using um, an NCD process. Um, well, it, we, were, we discussed today in our, in our work session that in fact an NCD can be more restrictive in, in some moments. Um, it doesn't have the front end protection that historic does. Um, it doesn't have that immediate protection that I know um, a, lot of, a lot of people in the community want. Um, while, you know, historic has that protection, it is monitored by a city entity. NCD has the ability for community to author their restrictions. Um, and that, that's just a, a quick note. Um, again, Office of Historic Preservation has led this charge and um, I've, I've just been honestly a little, not a little, very disappointed with the way in which I am receiving and the commission is receiving zoning cases and a lot of the controversy that has come up around the cases has been due to lack of communication. Um, you know, it's, it's, I understand the frustration of everyone here. You don't want to see this continue. No. But obviously the commission is struggling with how much information um, has been accumulated by the applicant. Um, I, I just wish there had been a lot more transparency and where the boundary lines were drawn um, and communication. Any other comments? Do you want, you don't want to make a motion just yet? Okay. 
All right, so again, um, let's try and keep comments brief, um, but give the commissioner um, some help on what we're all thinking. Um, right down here. Good. Okay. All right, I'll wait. I, I uh, have to agree with Commissioner Diaz Sanchez. Um, I'm very disappointed that in the um, OHP's presentation, lack of or just what's been done on, on this case and even a couple of others. Um, I I am in support. Of, um, I, I think it's a good idea in this particular area um, for historic designation. I, I feel like it would be very helpful to this uh, street, this community, uh, and I see the benefits of it. However, I, I feel like the process is, um, has not been a good one. Uh, I feel like there are so many people here um, who are not in favor of this, and this was initiated by the community. Um, and, and it seems to me that the community is, is saying they don't want it. Uh, I wish that um, you know, it had been presented maybe a little bit differently. Uh, I personally did not attend the, the various meetings, and I'm sorry that I didn't at this point. Um, but I'm, I'm having a very hard time. Uh, I will not uh, vote in favor of continuance. Uh, and I am um, having a very hard time, as much as faith in favor I am of a historic designation for this area, I feel like I cannot support it at this time. Always have staff be 
just be getting hit, hit down by everybody. I, I'm surprised. Um, obviously, like everybody else said, the process has not been helpful. Um, aside from all that, the, these cases are always so hard for us because it's a zoning case, but it's about historic, and we're not experts on historic zoning. We, well, all we can do is listen to what people say, and if I just feel uncomfortable with it. Um, I, I, I support, and, and I think Ms. Gonzalez, Yvonne Gonzalez, just spoke so beautifully in, about this neighborhood, and, and I, I really think it should have the historic designation, but then again, our own code makes it dependent on the majority. And I'm also uncomfortable by this sort of rolling majority kind of thing. It was a majority, then it's not a majority. Um, I actually do understand what you said about it, it actually makes sense to pull people out if, that you are gerrymandering. And there is a reason for that. And that actually made sense to me. It doesn't play well with the neighbors, but I, I can see why you're doing that. You guys are trying to do something that people do support. So if you all you're trying to get to over 50%, then I, I feel like it's wrong for me to go with what seems to be the minority of people on this. Um, so I'm not going to support a continuance, but if the commissioner suggests either um, support or denial of this request, I'm going to go with her either way on that one, because I am, I am really on the tipping point on this one. I think there's a good reason for it, but then I'm hearing the opposition. So we are ready for a motion. It's a good thing I didn't join the Zoning Commission to be liked. <laughs> um, I like you. <laughs> this is a challenge. I've been to several community meetings. Um, and again, Kathy, Kathy has worked really hard on this, um, most of OHP, so I, I also thank you. Um, I really cannot emphasize enough how much of the dysfunction with this case is due to communication. Um, it's just really frustrating. You know, at a certain point I understand gerrymandering, but then at what point do you take out other properties that aren't in support? Right. Where, where does that stop? It's, it's kind of the, the struggle for me because you're following a rule of thumb, um, but not consistently. And, not, and, and then not communicating to property owners and then that line changes, right? So I, I understand the logic of the process in which it's actually communicated to property owners is, is what is problematic. Um, I will not be making a motion for continuance. Um, it's tough. Um, Given all of the conversations and contact, um, I'm going to make it, make a motion for for denial of zoning case Z two o one seven o six one H. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any last comments? Remember again that any motion needs six votes to pass. The motion is for denial. Roll we'll call vote, please. Commissioner Diaz Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Garcia? Yes. Commissioner Head? Yes. Commissioner McGee? No. Commissioner Kimmy? Yes. Commissioner Rosales? Yes. Chair sure, no. Motion has set tonight. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for spending your day with us. We're going to take a one-minute stretch break, and then we have we have a few more cases.